Thank you for joining us here. Uh, my name is Jim Ellis. I'm the director of the Calgary Institute for the Humanities in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Calgary. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight, uh, both those of you who are joining us in person and those of you who are joining us online. Uh, I would like to extend a special welcome to the Faculty of Arts newly minted Dean, uh, Dr. Aoife McNamara, who's joining us here tonight, and also to Rod and Betty Wade, who made this evening possible. And thanks also to the folks here at Fort Calgary who are hosting us in style this evening. We're very happy for tonight's talk to be here at Fort Calgary National Historic Site, which is a site rich with many different histories and which has many resonances with tonight's talk. Uh, Fort Calgary was built on the confluence of the Bow and the Elbow Rivers, which for centuries has been a meeting place for local First Nations a place to hunt and trade and hold ceremony, and who called this place Mokinstis. Uh, the fort itself uh, was built in 1875 to house the Northwest Mounted Police as part of the westward colonial expansion. It is now a National Historic Site dedicated to being a space for reflection on these various histories and their consequences. And here I would like to explicitly acknowledge those peoples for whom Treaty 7 territories are their traditional homelands and still remain their home. The Siksika, the Tina, the Gainai, the Bakuni, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. This place would also become home, of course, to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, who traded here and just a bit across the river. Given the topic of tonight's talk, I think it's also important to remember other long-standing inhabitants of this particular land, the plants and the non-human animals that played important roles in both the economies and the thought systems of those original inhabitants, um, including, of course, coyote, uh, who we'll hear about tonight. Many of these belief systems saw these plants and animals not just as fellow creatures, but as family members or kin which points towards an ethical understanding and an ethical relation that is quite different than the instrumental relation uh, to animals upon which uh, many of our practices uh, are currently based, and which again is part of what we'll hear about tonight. Now, this is the second lecture uh, in the Calgary Institute for the Humanities Applied Ethics Program, uh, which was set up by the Wades to promote the public discussion of ethics. And this program is a bit complicated. It alternates from year to year. Uh, one year we have an invited internationally known ethicist. And one year we have a resident fellow, a professor from the University of Calgary uh, who works at the Institute for a year and then um, gives a public lecture. So some of you may have been present at the inaugural invited uh, applied ethics lecture, which took place back in uh, March or April. Uh, by Dr. Uh, Kwame Appiah from NYU, a renowned writer on ethics and cosmopolitanism. Um, our next invited uh, talk will be next March 30th, again at the Central Library. Uh, it will be the celebrated uh, writer, uh, Dr. Kate Mann from Cornell University, whose book, uh, Down Girl, The Logic of Misogyny, uh, was a widely praised uh, rethinking of the, of the structure of misogyny. Her talk is uh, going to be entitled, uh, The Authority of Hunger. So to learn about these or other events, uh, do please send us an e email, uh, sign up for our list, um, and uh, let us know. Now the talks by Appiah and Mann, as I've said, were the first two invited ethics lectures in the series. Tonight's is the first to be given by a resident fellow. Uh, but just before I introduce her, I did wanna say that tonight's talk will be followed by uh, reception to which you are all uh, warmly invited. Uh, there will also be a Q&A directly following the talk. And for those of you who are joining us online, you can put questions in the chat and I will try to relay them uh, to our speaker. And in honor of this very special event, I should say, uh, the U of C Press has made available complimentary copies of the CIH's book, Calgary City of Animals, uh, which features an essay by tonight's speaker, Dr. Alexander. So do please pick up a copy of this gorgeous book uh, on your way out. And thanks to UFC Press for doing that. So now it's my very great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Shelley Alexander, the inaugural Applied Ethics Fellow at the Calgary Institute for the Humanities. 
Uh, Dr. Alexander is a widely known and highly respected scholar of the relations between humans and non-human animals, and particularly the coyote. She's a professor of geography at the University of Calgary and the founder of the Canid Conservation Science Lab there, as well as a consultant for various wildlife organizations across North America. She's a member of the University Senate and a member of the Executive Committee of the Calgary Institute for the Humanities. Um, we were delighted to have her as our first Applied Ethics Fellow, where she was pursuing a project looking at the intersection of animal ethics, jurisprudence, and colonial systems. Uh, which has been the object of her study and field work for many years now. And her talk tonight comes from that work. Please welcome Dr. Shelley Alexander. Thanks, everybody. I just want to get some water here. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out for this first in-person event for a long time. And thanks everybody for joining on Zoom. I also want to just quickly thank Rod and Betty Wade for, for the opportunity to uh, do this, this uh, Applied Ethics Fellowship. And also thanks to um, Fort Calgary for hosting us. So tonight uh, my talk is Liminal Beings, Marginal Ethics. And just to get going, uh, <clears throat> my use of the word liminal is to describe something that is between states. And I think through the talk tonight, you'll see, you know, where I'm going with that. But basically, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's nothing, or it's something it's, it's urban, or it's not urban, it is, it's, it can be uh, between states, ethically, physically. And so I think you'll see some of that come out tonight. And in particular, I use this term to describe our urban coyotes. So I do want to just start this. There's not going to be a whole lecture on ethics. It's certainly not something I, I would feel qualified to do. But there's a couple of uh, terms and ways of thinking that I wanted to present so you understand where I'm coming from on this. And borrowing from Dr. Uh, Apia's uh, talk in the spring, I loved his use of the word eudaimonia, which was Aristotle's way of describing what is the purpose of ethics. So ethics is moral philosophy. It's us thinking about what should we do that's right and wrong. And when we have these discussions and when we act in a particular way, what we're trying to do is live in a way that allows us to have good demons uh, or to flourish as people. Briefly, there are a few ethical frameworks that just sort of illustrate to you, I think, the complexity of, of doing this, but uh, deontological, consequentialist, virtue ethics, and a variety of others. These are the frameworks by which you might make your decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, um, deontological, that's rule-based. You're not worried about, you, you don't focus on the consequences, you focus on uh, applying those rules. So if it's uh, thou shalt not kill, um, it, there is no excuse for killing. Um, if it's consequentialist, you're focused on what is the outcome of that? So maybe we shouldn't kill, but under certain circumstances, that maybe is okay. So for example, if an animal needs to be put down, you believe you don't want to kill an animal, but um, it's suffering. And so in that context, the consequence is positive. And so you will break from that rule. Virtue ethics is another example of basically doing what is virtuous. You believe that's the virtuous act. And so we see all of these kinds of things come out to play with, uh, with coyotes, come into play with coyotes. Uh, but I think what's important to take from that is that our ethical framework that that we that governs us on a day to day basis, we have developed that by you know our exposure over time, our situated knowledge, our community that we grew up in, our family, uh, and then maybe we're fortunate enough to run into other people who think different ways, and we absorb some of those bits and pieces. And but I think one of the things that is, is clear about this is sometimes, if not often, we don't interrogate why we have the ethics that we do. And so tonight's talk is about thinking about these with respect to animals. So tonight's talk focusing on reconciling wildlife ethics laws um, with evidence. This falls within the topic of animal ethics. And what's important and distinct about animal ethics is instead of focusing on, on, on the human and what's ethical with respect to what we do to other beings, 
and, and, and other human beings. This puts animal subjectivity and agency at the heart of the questions. So it's, it's asking us to think about the fact that these animals have experience. I choose coyotes as the focal species um, because I think they expose a lot of the ethical inconsistencies that we have for most wildlife and for a lot of the animals that we engage with on a day to day basis. So this falls into the realm of applied ethics because what, uh, what I'm talking about tonight is how do we treat this animal? Why do, what are some of the evidence of why we treat it that way? And maybe should we be shifting to a different way of treating them? But it's applying the principles of, of, of thinking about eth ethics, moral philosophy to this particular question. Now, everything I talk about tonight is, is intertwined. And so uh, I tried to find a way to structure it and it's very hierarchical, um, but you're gonna see this slide a few times just to, so you can keep track of where I'm going because uh, as I say, all of these topics are related. So the path for tonight, first I'm gonna frame the ethical challenge and how I got here. And then the second part is the mechanisms of oppression, including colonialism, ways of knowing animals, jurisprudence, and then dropping down to how do we reconcile this if we were to think about reconciling it. So you'll see this pop up just so you can keep track. This work really started when I worked with my colleague, Dr. Diane Draper, doing interviews. And this was outside of my normal area of, of work. Normally, I, I did ecological natural sciences work. And, um, and we interviewed 48 landowners in the area. And these were in-depth interviews in situ on their property. We talked to them about their attitudes and values towards coyotes, wildlife, you know, uh, when they killed, why they killed, um, and pulled all of that together into something a lot more complicated than this, this diagram. But um, that essentially all I want to communicate of the take home messages from that is that worldviews and about worldviews as they relate to coyote killing. There are a variety of ways that people engage and think about coyote. You can see they adore, admire, tolerate, repel, subjugate, and even torture. So I can tell you this is some of the toughest work I ever did, having to do interviews and listening to people talk about how they torture, what, what would qualify as animal torture. But the other thing that I think is important is that they turn out to be a social political thing that is used to exact power. So if, if if a rural landowner feels that an urban landowner is imposing their values, they may kill more coyotes because they think that the rural person thinks that an urban person um, is a coyote lover. So they may kill coyotes to reverse, to flip that power balance back over. Killing also reinforces group solidarity, and I'll come back to that later. But the, the, the big thing I think is the lack of constraints in this environment and the really the, the, the inconsistent education, the history of you know, what these animals are used for and the lack of really powerful laws means that it's an anything go, goes ethic. And this, uh, we didn't do the work on this, but the stats are one coyote per minute are shot um, or, or killed in some manner in North America, just mostly out of fear um, or preempting problems that haven't happened, so. There was an inflection point for me that I think really brought me around here to this talk tonight. And that was that I've been working with a family on campus for three years um, and got to know them you know, very well. And one of the, the family of coyotes. And in September of 2020, uh, I got a call early in the morning that there was a dead pup on the side of the road. So I, I said, okay, well, you know, the usual put it in a freezer. Um, so, so that, and then we can maybe do a necropsy on it later and, and, and give it some honor when, when, when we get rid of the body. But, um, what happened was I got the next call that said, actually it's still alive. So I drove in and, um, I pulled it off the road, got it up to the forest where it's, it's other litter mates were, were spooling, you know, were, were, you know, swimming around in the forest watching anyway. Uh, his back end was completely destroyed. And so I knew it needed to be put down, called the only agency that I thought is, is responsible for this, Fish and Wildlife. And the message that was on the machine, I was quite shocked by, said, we do not attend to issues with pest species, including coyotes, bobcats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And no vet will touch this because it's a wild animal. Um, so I, while I was there with an animal, I wasn't equipped to um, euthanize. Um, we've since put a program in place to deal with this on, on campus, but 
because it was a nuisance or pest, no agency will attend to euthanize it. And um, so I, I ended up waiting with it for probably an hour and a half um, before we could put it down. So it suffered for all that time. Um, and if they're also restricted, so even if it had been able to be recovered, they're restricted. You can't take them somewhere to, to fix them. So in my, you know, when I look at this, I think, I think we would all agree that uh, at least in our, in, in our society here, morality says we should not deliberately be cruel to animals, but inflicting and, and pro inflicting and prolonging pain without justifiable cause is actually cruel. Um, and so uh, in conclusion for me for that, the failure of the responsible agent to end the pain due to a disputable legal label seems cruel and wrong. Um, and in fact, if you go to the Criminal Code of Canada, uh, you'll find that animals, if you, it prohibits willfully causing suffering, neglect, pain, et cetera, on animals. So, so why, the, why does this animal get treated differently? So tonight, the, moving into the, the, what are the invisible structures that entrain this oppression and marginalization of wildlife species? So what's the difference? Why do we treat this? Well, these are some coyote pups that I helped raise in a captive facility at eight weeks, and then uh, one of my dogs at eight weeks. Why do we treat them so differently? Um, and, and where did that come from? I say invisible structures because tonight's supposed to be about you know picking apart and exposing those things, uh, but I think a lot of them aren't really invisible. It's just how they affect us, maybe we haven't thought about. Um, so the first thing is marginalization, colonialism. And Jim uh, talked about this a little bit, but just this diagram, I think this diagram, this, this painting, I think um, just captures the whole idea and, and, and destruction so well, American Progress by John Gast. Um, and it's depicting the colonies expanding from the East to the West Coast and civilizing this empty land. That's the only thing on it are things that we probably don't want, you know, um, and or there might be some resources that we can use. And this is Columbia. She's floating along and as she moves from the behind her, you can see the light is coming on the forehead. She wears a star, which is symbolic of the United States. And so I think this is the, the idea that drove and, and, uh, and, and drove the destruction. So far from an empty space, I love this map because this is actually done for the whole of North America, but it shows you nativeland.ca is where you can find it. It shows you this was a populated, populated, organized, uh, uh, you know, a, a nation of nations. And um, what we did was we came in on top and we threw down our uh, colonial mesh. So we label Canada, you know, Alberta, Montana, et cetera. And the colonial mesh is an idea that was put forward by Andrew Wolford in the book called Discipline, Discipline Territorial in the Colonial Mesh. And what he talks about is that this mesh gets thrown down and, and then the colonists squeeze certain parts of it in order to make people comply or whatever it is they're interested in to comply. And then there's resistance and, and there's people break out of the, what, you know, whatever is being imposed on them. And then they, just, they re readjust and squeeze in a different way. And this is discussing people, but it's actually the way that coyotes were dealt with and still continue to be dealt with. When it doesn't work one way, you come in at them another way, right? It's, it's a, basically a war against this animal. But what it means is colonization means that indigenous, humans and non-humans were all enmeshed and the unwanted continue to be um, subjugated, continue to be marginalized and oppressed here. And, and for wildlife, it's those species that are named um, uh, pests that are worse, that, are, are, that suffer the most. I think in terms of our relationship to animals, the biggest challenge that, the, the biggest thing that has happened here is that, as Jim was talking about, this relational worldview that existed on this landscape was just imprinted. So where, on, with, with a colonial worldview. So where we had a world that looked at all things as being important and connected to the land, and they're being balanced and being holistic, we imprinted a hierarchical way of knowing that came with from the colonies. And so this is a top down, man is at the top and everything by virtue of being lower is oppressed, right? It's authoritarian, du dualistic. It's not a sustainable model. 
So moving on to the ways of knowing animals in that hierarchical sense, where what's the roots of that how did we get to where we are because i think these models still they they still heavily inform how we deal with every animal every day so the first one is um aristotle's first attempt at describing the nature of the world and how things relate to each other so scala natura and in that uh aristotle describes how we have the lower plants we move up in a in a hierarchy through the reptiles birds mammals all the way up to humans at the top so that's the pinnacle and what this describes is is what we call speciesism the ones lower down are worth less experience less than the ones at the top and it's about human exceptionalism it's about at, if you're at the top and you're human that means you're the benchmark against which everything else is compared right so which which often is is well it's a wrong it's a flawed assumption to be comparing to be comparing to the human as if the human is the pinnacle of existence now uh, aristotle wasn't all bad we'll come back to him in a bit cartesian ways of knowing so the thing that happened after that was kind of well later there's 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 obviously bits and pieces in between, but I think this is the other major influence is Descartes' work, where De Descartes described animals as complex material automata. So their behavior can be described by their organs, nerves, and muscles just, just moving. Uh, they can't understand pain. And when they make those screaming vocalizations or squealing in happiness, whatever, those aren't emotions, those aren't feelings, they're just involuntary responses. So that formed the foundation of how people thought about animals for quite a while within this Western uh, paradigm anyway. But there was a lot of stuff happening. There were a lot of people contesting Descartes' ideas. And although we still flip back to Descartes, right? Uh, we still sort of think that way about some animals. But if you look at Aristotle, even long before said, animals like humans have a purpose or a telos. And that telos is natural. That, that telos is about, they have, a, they, they have an innate, uh, 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 sorry, um, intrinsic value to their life just to be alive. Jeremy Bentham, 1789. And I picked out just a few to show this progression. 1789, the question is not, it, can they uh, reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And you see, this was in his, his work on principles of morals and legislation. Then John Stuart Mill in Principles of Political Economy, 1848, the reason for legal intervention in favor of children apply no less to the victims of the most brutal part of mankind the lower animals so john stuart mill is actually um, the one that uh, is credited with developing utilitarianism which is this idea of uh, when we make an ethical decision it should be the one that the fewest people suffer then darwin came along and actually put in these these you know, are our, our big scientists that we gravitate towards Darwin conducted experiments, including children, uh, adults, and you know dogs, cats, and then also what he labeled as, as, as insane. So people who had been institutionalized and, and were non-vocal. Uh, and he looked at facial expressions uh, in all of those across the species. And he concluded that humans differ uh, only by degree, not by kind. At that point, we thought it was thought that we'd overcome Descartes' dualism. And I like this later quote by David Hume, where he says, no truth appears to be more evident than the beasts are endowed with thought and reason as well as men. And he went on to make some uh, very uh, sharp comments about Descartes' uh, capacity. Um, so, what, so, so basically we're on this like positive trajectory to people thinking about it in terms of science, in, in philosophical discussion. And then all of a sudden, by about 1920, everything collapses and we start moving away from thinking about animal mentation. So what happened? In Rollins, Rollins 2016 book uh, uh, called Telos, uh, wonderful book if you're interested in, in these topics, but he describes and attributes this change to Watson's work on behavioral, behavioralism. So Watson is a psychologist who's looking at understanding why behavior develops uh, the way it does in humans. And he denies the reality of consciousness. He says that, that we shouldn't be looking at trying to understand the machinations behind people's actions, because when we look at that, we are being 
subjective. We can't possibly measure that. The only thing that's worth measuring is the external. There is no such thing as consciousness. People are just can be molded to do what we want if we put them in the right environment. And this, you know, this caught on. Um, and there's little bits of shreds of behavioralism that still are used today in, in therapy. But the key thing here was because of that, by around the 1920s, um, animal mentation was erased. So you don't see it again, uh, you know, according to Rollins' assessment, you don't really see it again until much later in the 1900s. It also intertwined with capitalism because at this point in time, if you can produce a perfect human being, it doesn't matter where you came from and you can make a lawyer and you can make a doctor and you can make, you know, whatever. Um, then you can have a much more functional system. And so it kind of it fed into this idea of capitalist expansion, um, ex enhancing human productivity. And also at the same time, we're moving into more animal testing and mass production uh, of, of animals for consumption. The other thing that was going on here was a scientism, what we refer to now as scientism, and that is science really love for itself. And at this, this point, it obviously dovetails fairly well. Science, science believed that science and measurability is the only objective knowledge and is, and is objective truth. And if you are doing objective science, at this, that, that belief would be that if animals are being involved, then they don't have a subjective experience. You must shove that down. Um, and the other famous statement that comes from this period of time is emotion and philosophy have no place in objective science. And I've even heard people say that to me within the last five years when I've brought up issues of animal welfare. This does not belong in science. This has had an enduring negative effect on animals in conservation and in, in, in wildlife research. Because what this has done, and I've seen this in students that, that you know, I interact with, where there's, a, there's actually a fear you see that we use the word welfare and then they'll, they'll, they'll backpedal and you can see the concern about being thought of is how might this affect because they're learning in a different mode. It also um, uh, creates a pressure to objectify in the field. So people who are doing research will move towards an objective standpoint where you, 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 you cramp down those emotions. It shouldn't be there. There's also an issue with variable accountability because we don't have laws and we don't have really good governing bodies consistently to deal with how we do research. So you end up with people doing a lot of self-policing or agencies doing self-policing and you end up with suffering and pain um, in, the, in the field. And I have some thoughts about you know, what, what juncture we came to in that uh, in around the 1970s and 80s that might have, might have led to that, but these are things that are percolating um, in my mind, and I did include here. So the last part I want to talk about is jurisprudence in terms of the mechanisms of oppression. So colonialism and speciesism all of a sudden get pulled in and enshrined into law. Animals are resources in Canada, wild, an, all animals, but what, but they're, res so they're resources or they're property things, right? So our domestic animals are, are property. There's better laws dealing with domestics than there are wildlife, but Essentially, with wildlife, there's legal controls on reproduction, movements, and accesses to resource, resources. So it's, a, it's all about controlling and manipulating. All things that are labeled things, those are all killable. Those are all for our use. I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but, but you know, uh, I can refer you to places later to, for more information on it. But we can break our wildlife management uh, into three sort of dominant periods. In the 1930s, after, after colonization and all of the animals had been wiped out and, uh, and, and the colonists blamed the First Nations for that, um, game management era was implemented. And the game management era was, well, there was one key act, which was the Wolf Bounty Act, which was for killing wolves and pups. And then the, the people were encouraged to kill a whole bunch of other things like crows and uh, other problem animals. And so um, the, there, then there were several game management acts that followed from that, but mostly describing this, these animals in these categories that we needed to kill or not. The wildlife management era shifted into thinking about the mechanisms of controlling populations, of working towards conservation, uh, and 
prohibiting killing in uh, provincial lands or provincial parks and national parks, et cetera. Then in the 1980s, we move into the sustainable wildlife management where we get stuff like uh, the Endangered Species Act. 1942, the big star, that's the earliest I can find the Alberta Pest Species Act. You know, it's not, if, for somebody who's not a, a trained in, in, in law or, or finding legal documents, it was a bit tricky to come back to this, but at 1942, is where I first see reference to the um, Pest Management Act in Alberta. And from then, the, the, what, what we do and what species we do may have been added to the list, but nothing has really changed about how we engage with those animals. To give you an example of some of the labels that get used in these contexts, in the Wildlife Act on the left-hand side there, you can see Wildlife, it, there's a variety of classifications. One of them is a fur-bearing uh, animal. There are Alberta hunting regulations and Alberta trapping regulations that specify what you can do with these animals. So Alberta hunting, you can hunt them without a license. Alberta trapping, they can be hunted, not trapped all, all year round. Um, you, there are trap lines you have to have permits for, and you have to have licenses for fur export. And coyotes are the most harvested fur bearer. In the Agricultural Pests Act on the right side, um, you can see coyotes are declared as a nuisance. So there are certain fur bearing animals that get to have a special label attached to them. And, and that is, um, and one of them is coyote. When you actually look at that list of animals on the pest species list, it's kind of interesting because it's like, they're all like little mice and bird, little birds. And then there's like coyote. Um, so, so it's kind of funny, but um, not. And then um, there are pest and nuisance control regulations that feed into that tell us how we can control these nuisances on our own land. But you can also have anybody you want come by and, and, and control those animals. You can use devices, for example, guns or poison. You can destruct, destroy dens, or you can chase them down and kill them with dogs if you want, um, as long as you have a permit to do so. All of those things I want to point out that here, what's interesting to me is that if you do this, if, you, if you're in an area and you chase wildlife or your dog does any of this kind of stuff or you use those without, uh, 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 it, it, say in a national park, you wouldn't, you, just, you wouldn't be allowed to do this, right? These are considered non-ethical uh, practices. In terms of being declared a pest or a nuisance, how does that happen? If the minister considers that an animal, bird, insect, plant, or disease may pose uh, or poses a risk of destroying or harming um, a particular habitat um, or is likely to uh, destroy or harm that, then the minister may by regulation declare that species a, species a pest. And so, uh, or a, a nuisance, so coyotes are a nuisance. But what I think is important about this is it shows that there's a, an element of it's discretional, right? So if you have enough people talking about it, then uh, you know enough in one interest group talking about it, then that can sway what happens. Um, it's context specific because in particular it was our, our targeted for public lands or uh, agricultural lands. And it really lacks any biological rationale when you dig into it. So the nexus of all those three things I've talked about that I think what happens here is that when you've got laws that are premised on outdated ideology that has come across uh, with colonization that foster marginalizing ethics and foster uh, oppression as well. And if you have group solidarity or special interests who are shored up by maintaining status quo, we end up with a situation of marginalization, oppression, and violence being perpetrated um, and normalized. And I think because we don't, if you're not facing this stuff every day, uh, you, you may not realize that this is going on in the background. It has been normalized as sort of the way that we should do things. So let's talk about something a little bit happier than that, which is reconciling this. What are our options to flourish here? So one of the challenges with, with bringing these animals back out from uh, into you know, a better status is that improved ethics treads into human versus non-human rights, and people can get quite sensitive about, about this. Um, because per the, when we're talking about laws in Canada, there are persons and there are property or things, and only persons are eligible for rights. So whoever is defined to be a person um, is eligible for rights. Animals are not persons in the law, 
Um, so animals don't have rights. So in order to have them rise up a little bit, we have to change their designation. One of the ways that we can do this is reconciling our ethics via capacity for personhood. One of the ways that you can do this is through a, de demonstrating autonomy. So autonomy is considered a capacity sufficient, but not necessary for personhood. And I have the little asterisk there because I want to just clarify that personhood is a, is a legal term. It doesn't mean, it does not mean you must be human. It is, it is, it is that, that that thing is given rights. So there are rivers that have been given personhood. There are cities that have, you know, there are, are objects uh, other than animals that have been granted personhood. So a being with autonomy is a unique individual who has desires, plans, intentionality, and a sense of self. It is relevant for most judges to uh, give basic liberty rights to humans, but not yet to, to animals. But if we were to grant autonomy, violations of that autonomy is considered a serious harm. So how would we decide if an animal has autonomy? There's a series of questions there. These I've, I've derived from Marino 2021 and Jones 2019 who, who are working in this area of non-human rights. Um, does the animal act intentionally? Does the animal make and carry out plans? Does it understand the world around it um, and its interaction with others? Does it make knowledge-based decisions? Does it appear to have a sense of the future? So I'm going to go back to coyote here. Does coyote have autonomy? Question mark. They have purposeful monogamy. So they mate with one for life. Um, they choose one partner and they are bonded. And the only time that that bond is disrupted is if the part, one of the partners dies. So they may pair, they may, may or will pair with another uh, animal. Every year, the same time, January, they start hanging around together. You see them, they form their bonded pair again, they get connected and he and she do not leave each other's side. They will be traveling a, a maximum two minutes apart for until she goes underground in April and has babies. She has, they have distinct roles. She's underground looking after the pups. He is out provisioning for the eight week, five to eight weeks that she's, she's principally responsible for the pups. He is the one that must provide her with food. She's responsible, so she does leave occasionally. Um, but this is a very purposeful, non-random um, uh, behaviors that happen here. They engage in allo parenting, which means both, both the mother and the father are engaged in the pup rearing. They equally carry those duties once the pups are out of the den. And some of these, I apologize, the, the slides are a bit blurry, but um, the reason is I wanted you to see what I see. These are all from my research cameras, and these are the coyotes that are living around you and sometimes you know, much closer than you know. Um, and so uh, they, they engage in allo parenting. They, they split the, the, the that's, it's efficient, right? It's very much, it's the same as why we will engage in co-parenting, right? Um, they have non-parental caregivers. So once the pups reach a certain age, they have the babysitter here come in. And you can see, I know the babysitter because the babysitter has bad, like kind of bad hair, uh, sticks, up, sticks up in the air. And what's interesting is the, the pup's behavior towards the babysitter is very different than what it is towards the, the parents. The parent's job is to feed. The babysitter's main job is to look after. So the babysitter will play with the pups and they get so excited. When the, when the babysitter comes in and mom and dad are heading out, they get incredibly excited. They have awareness of self and others. And somehow last year, I mean, this, this, this is two years ago, this family was only maybe 75 yards from a, from a very busy daycare. Um, <laughs> so interestingly, somebody uh, hucked them or they found in one of their, day, their journeys at night a stuffy. But, uh, but, but this, what, why I say awareness of self is that this one pup, that pup, that was, that was its toy. And, it, and amazingly, that got, it got it in about June and in September, they're gone. And the, I went in the site and there's still that little thing, totally intact. But the camera shows only this pup always carrying that and defending it from the others. So there's a sense of, this is mine, you are different. Um, so just like with kids, you are, you are different, this is mine. Um, and I want to keep this for myself. 
every year there's at least there's there's usually just one actually pup who loves the cameras and likes to likes to show off in front of the cameras and this was the same this was the same one so started out at about eight weeks at the very bottom left corner there um, and and these are different sites with the same same um, the the same pup coming to the camera as it went through time. Uh, so I don't know you know why is it doing that it, it, I don't know, um, but it, it was really interesting that I think and anecdotally um, when when I would see when things were going wrong like maybe a dog had run into the enclosure um, or to the area where they were they would go to the camera. So I don't know if they sense the camera is like the all-knowing eyeball or what, but um, they also have individuation. So here you see the mom has returned after a couple of days. The pups are going bananas. They recognize her as different from just another female coyote. So just like, you know, parents have been gone for a while, kids, kids are missing them. And they also show from this show kin recognition. So they, they also recognize if a pup rolls in here, um, and that doesn't belong to them, there, there will be pushback. They also engage in imitation and attention. So this is a young pup imitating the dad. And the dad is looking towards, I know there are people on the other side of the trees from it. So I know that he's watching, but the pup is, is engaged in imitation and attention, which is learning to direct its attention, joint attention, knowing that if the, if the dad is looking there, I should probably look there. And this is part of development of theory of mind, some of the, the components of developing theory of mind with people. They engage in boundary setting, rank recognition, and forethought. Boundary setting, what's happening here is pups are in an area called the rendezvous site. They're about 10 weeks old. And the mom is leaving, and the pup is followed. And she's turned around and saying, go back. You don't go past this boundary. And they will stay in that boundary. What it implies is that she, um, the pup understands that she's the boss. She's the, there's a rank recognition there, right? But also when I look, if I were looking at humans and, and describing this ethnographically, I would say that she's thinking about the fact she's coming back. She wants to make sure that pup's still there. So she's telling him where you have to stay. Because if you leave this area, I've picked this area for you to be safe. And you could say, well, maybe coyotes just learn that. And after 10 weeks, they, they know the boundaries 100, 100 yards and you never go out of that little circle. But this year, I, um, and this has happened several times, watching pups in transition between the natal den and onward to the rendezvous site. These pups were given the, uh, it's about 7 a.m. in the morning in this tight, awful little culvert. And they did not come out until the parents came back and, and squeaked at the end and gave them a bit of food at about three o'clock. They did it again, didn't come out till 7 p.m. at night. So this is adapting that knowledge of what is she telling me to do to contact. This is not a situation, these little culverts were, were horribly tight. So, so it's demonstrating that they are taking that out of that context. And the final thing, and um, for, for coyotes tonight that I want to talk about is justice morality. There's been lots of work done on play in social canids. And what we use, we actually use um, canids, social play and canids to understand human, the development of socialization in humans. Um, but being social requires obeying rules. So there, there are rules of engagement here and play is where all that happens. That happens through things like bite inhibition, um, and uh, role reversal. And so it involves vocalizations and gestures to communicate what's going on. And play is fun. So you want play to keep happening, but when you break the rules, then play will stop. So if you break the rules by biting too hard, just like a kid picks up sand and hucks in another kid's face in the sandbox, game's over, right? And you want the game to go on. And in order for the game to go on, they actually have a cue, a gesture to, I'm really sorry. Can we keep playing? And then they agree and they carry on. So rule breaking actually has consequences in social carnivores, including being socially ostracized. So if one is not comfortable with the idea of personhood for animals, it can also just go by reconciling by sentience. And that is in, uh, Peter Singer's uh, famous quote that one species should not be the fact in moral decision-making. 
What matters is one interest that the capacity to suffer should be sufficient for moral consideration in law. I think sentience is a given for most mammals. I would say all mammals, but I'm putting being qualifying here as most. Personhood is strongly suggested in my mind from all of the things that we see about these social animals. Um, and so considering that legal reform, ensuring protection from suffering and pain and options to be able to prosper again within the realm of being a coyote or, your, or the coyote telos um, seems necessary and right. So I'm not here tonight, it's not my job to tell you how you have to live your life or how everybody else should live their life. But I think my role is to expose some of the inconsistencies that exist uh, with the way that we treat different, different animals. And in particular, the way we've chosen to label and treat these animals. When we talk about animal ethics and wildlife ethics, this is a societal question. This is, this is not my, decide, my choice to make the decision on what happens. This is society's choice. I don't think it should be up to the, to the, the, um, the, the, the discretion of, uh, of one, or, one or another minister, nor should it be the discretion of certain um, special interest group. This is a societal discussion that needs to happen. I do have... I do have my concluding remarks on it based on the evidence of what I see and experience. These are not pests. I don't think they, they are not pests. They are not things. What they are is nations of beings. So we need to, based on the evidence that, that I look at, we need to reconcile wildlife ethics and animal laws with evidence. We need to remove these labels that cause harm. And we need to redesignate these animals and all animals as beings. And we need to reframe the practice that goes along with that. Um, and finally, we need to remember our right ethical relations and obligations to be species. So the question I will leave you with to, to mull over is, is it time to pull these animals and other animals out of the colonial mesh? Thank you. Thanks so much, Shelley, uh, for that wonderfully stimulating gallop <laughs> through the question of animal ethics, particularly with respect to coyote. Now, I thought I was going to be able to field questions on the chat, but my computer is not working. So I might have to ask Sean if he's listening to somehow uh, get the questions to me. Oh, he's got a phone. You'll text them to me. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> How wonderfully technological we've become. We'll have some questions from the audience. Uh, we'll have some, some questions from the audience as well. Um, um, the legal protections on animals change, like if they're in like activity or if they're cats and pet, like they're not technically a pest. Well, I mean, you're not legally, you can't, you shouldn't have them as a pet. You probably have to have a special license to be able to have them, hold them as a pet. But um, does their designation change? Well, if they, they're still labeled a pest species, but if they are in, say, in a national park, they fall under different regulations with respect to the animals aren't, they're not, they're not treated the same within the national park. So yes, they're still labeled the same, um, but they may be treated differently in those, those contexts. An animal within a, a zoo enclosure, like a coyote within a, a rescue, like not a rescue, but like say the uh, places that have the wolves and the coyotes, those animals fall under different laws, yeah. But they're still out, they're still considered a pest species. They're still labeled a pest species, right? So, yes. Here's a question from the chat, which relates to a point you were just making, or am I interrupting? Sorry. No, no. Okay. Uh, for those listening. of us not in this field, how can we help to make a change? Is, are there any projects in motion to recognize the coyote as a being? Oh, um. I don't think so. Uh, there are uh, the Jane Goodall bill right now is, uh, I think, just been put uh, put forward. Um, I think what it is is it's stepping forward, and you know, we well, we need. I'm not a lawyer, right, and I'm not trained in law, and and so we need people uh, who are versed in 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 law to be engaged in this. We do have some good groups in Canada. Uh, who are who are leading that way in um, in animal in animal rights? But in terms of coyotes, this would be in the wildlife realm, pushing into 
um, pushing into consideration for personhood is relatively, uh, you know, new concept. Um, but while there are laws that govern, and as in the Jane Goodall Act, which will govern all any wild animals that are living in captivity that require a different consideration for those animals within that experience. But um, so I think it's, it's, it's putting out the feelers on what is, I don't know where to look because I'm, I'm on Zoom, but um, it's putting out the feelers to what organizations are engaged in, in that kind of work uh, and figuring out how can you facilitate that, whether it's, it, um, you know, whether it's through being involved in mobilizing that message outwards or to, uh, to uh, lawmakers and figuring out how do we actually do this, right? I think <laughs> the challenge is that you, my, my, what I understand is animals, right? And I understand them in the context of, of sentience and of needing protection, but I don't know how to get across that, that uh, into changing the laws. And so, you know, we need people who are, who are willing to come together and work on those challenges but we do have some organizations in 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 Canada and I can talk I can list those later but back here Dr. Alexander you made a case for sentience in pulmonary species you I think you also make a very good case for there being a uh, if not a lack of between those species then perhaps a symbiotic relationship my question to you is this, that relationship depends upon the context within which those species exist. And that context differs from urban area to the wildlife area, to the, let me say, uh, other areas which are controlled by government. So I'm, I'm not sure how, how you develop laws which will relate to the context of that within the show. Oh, I, I think that's, yeah, you've, you've hit a key point there is we, we can have federal level laws that engage, that, that designate something as sentient or not, but then, then we have to translate that into each of those diff, those, those, the, 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 the acts that govern those animals within all of those different contexts. And so that's a, that's a major, a major overhaul because if you have an act that's laid out that treats them just as as resources well you've got how do you embed this notion of sentience because it goes not just to what's that animal designated but then how does every agency that relies on that thing how are they supposed to treat those animals in each of these different contexts right so it is it's i i i don't think it's it's a it's a it's a it's, a, it's not a simple simple answer but that's where we need to i think just start talking across these 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 boundaries because that's not something that i'm right that's I, I i can tell you what needs to happen and i can tell you the challenges ahead of us but but how we mechanistically go through that and make those changes to the laws and then how does it trickle down to each of these contexts thank you uh, yeah, so thank you so much for talking. Yes, I have a, in, in essence, a cause and effect question, and that is, uh, to what extent pre-colonialization, pre-industrial revolution, pre-scientific, pre-capitalism, in other words, 15th century, early earth, uh, is there an identifiable sort of discontinuity or difference between the way humans view non-humans in the Western world, and also in East Asia. You have oh, cultures yeah. in millennia, yeah. Japan, yeah. Korea, yeah. Vietnam, yeah. China, which also have really were no colonialism for millennia, capital, capitalism to persist, scientism. So you see fundamental differences in their human, non-human view. Yeah, well, there are, you know, I mean, I, just, I I don't have the capacity in this to have to have gone into all of that, but definitely you have, you know, enduring ways of knowing animals outside of that, outside of the Western sort of context, uh, uh, whether it's Buddhism or Jainism or or 
uh, anim anim animus in the Celtic animus who have different relationships with animals that engage with them as if they are and, and in in Af in um, Australia Aboriginal po uh, uh, populations uh, and so we have those contexts in which there are different there is a different philosophical approach to these animals and they may even embody the the you know spirits of ancestors or they are part of the family. So those exist and still exist. I think, and um, depending on, I'm, I'm not enough of a specialist in, or remotely enough of a specialist to talk about each of those. But so for example, uh, if you, it, it, in Buddhism, you know, animal killing animals isn't uh, acceptable. Um, and so that still persists, right? That, but that is also not, that's a philosophical framework. Uh, Buddhism. So, um, so I think there are these other these other worlds uh, out there. There are even scientists, say in Japan, who uh, don't don't follow this idea that we have to be an objective. They actually talk about immersive experience and and subjective experience is what's important for those animals to understand them, not this sort of hands off back. And so. Um, even though, and I've, I have thought about this a little bit, because even though we may have been, those countries may have been, or countries, many countries, nations may have been um, predominated by a certain uh, ideology, there are still animals that seem to fall outside of that and still go into this sort of species, this realm. But I would say there are areas where that's not the case, say, for example, with Buddhism. Um, so there are different models out there. Yeah, I don't, I hope that addressed your, your question, but so, and I mean, and then there were, you know, what I, I don't really like the term Western because when I think about, um, you know, there were, as I said, the Celt animists were, uh, they believed in animal spirits and, and, and animals having capacities and that. So that, the, that those are the people that colonized so lit much later, so. so. We've got a flood of questions from the interweb. Uh, one interesting one is, I think it's about what we might call gradations of uh, ethical consideration. So can we think in that way? Or is it, I mean, um, like, for example, if, if science suddenly said, Shelley, you're completely wrong, they don't have emotions, uh, that's projection. Uh, presumably, they would still be um, worthy of ethical consideration, would they not? And is there a kind of do we stack things in a hierarchy, I guess, is, is what this question might be implying from in terms of the almost consider. human, oh, uh, yeah, the yes, apes, yes, yes, yeah. down, to, the, there's also down to the jellyfish. These, these are not the only frameworks that you can, that, that can be followed with respect to trying to think about how, how to recognize um, animal sentience. So it can be, there's others that are, it's, it's a constant, a constant state of debate as to how to do this, but there's likeness to humans. So getting to how close is that animal to humans in terms of their capacity to think. Um, though uh, people have challenged that because it, it, it says that, well, for an animal to be considered, it must be like a human. Whereas um, an animal can have a full range of capacities and some of those may be actually more developed than humans. So whether it's whales have social consciousness based on you know, looking at their brains, uh, and the number of uh, uh, different types of cells, you can determine that that animal actually has more capacity for compassion and, uh, and community orientation than humans do. So this idea of, of using humans as the equivalent or human mind, how close are you there before will notch you down the hierarchy is, is often challenged. Uh, and so, yes, but I think there is always this hierarchy applied, right, to the situation. Um, I, I, I don't think that we should be looking at it that way because each of these animals has a capacity to live its life fully in different ways than, than human beings do. Um, and like I said, in some ways, I would say more richly than or more compassionately than, than humans do. So I hope that answers the question. There are, there, and there are different models of trying to get at this, this question of representation. Okay, back over here.
Well, I um, stewardship in terms of um, do you mean in terms of the concept in terms of how people manage their land themselves as the private landowners or stewardship in another? Okay, yeah, I, I think it, I think these are similar. These are similar concepts, and I can't speak to. Uh, it's not really my place to speak to how First Nations um, or Indigenous philosophy on on animals. But in terms of the idea that you're presenting for uh, stewardship, it's similar to what we talk about when we're talking about stu landowner stewardship, and it's about holistic about. Um, about trying to maintain all of those parts of the ecosystem to keep it functioning and in balance as it was be as it was before we showed up. So I think it it fits it fits in here in that in in where we're trying to go with this it, or where I'm trying to take this tonight is that each of those species um, needs to be considered to be a valuable part of that system as opposed to relegated to one class or another and killed indiscriminately or not, right? So we, the, you have to look at that as a functioning group or assemblage and that by protecting that, we protect all, right? So that that's where I see stewardship anyway. My understanding of concept fit in. Yep. Yes. In. Oops, sorry. Right. Right. Yeah, I think I, I, I thanks for the question. I think I think both have to happen. I don't think we just take one route or the other um, because this is not gonna be a fast process. Um, but the idea of ecosystem services is that the animal will provide something in that service, in that system. So it's maybe controlling small small rodent populations that might be eating, uh, might be eating someone's crops. Uh, so it's part of providing a service to, to people. That is really more of an instrumental role Yet, yet it's one of the ways that we can recognize this and, and it is effective in moving people towards a different way of looking at uh, these animals. And so I think it's, I don't think it fully flies in the face of it. It's a different approach to it. Um, it's not looking at that animal as an instrumental use to us by killing it or using it. It's maintaining it provides an instrumental value to the ecosystem. So I see it as sort of a companion um, to the idea of, of also allowing these species to have recognition as well. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up because I think it connects back to stewardship. And I, I was gonna go, uh, I'd forgotten something I was gonna say with that, is that this is one of the great, the great values that we have on this landscape is we still have large intact ranches and protected areas that are doing this kind of, you know, where the, the in, in my interviews with ranching communities, it's very split down the middle. Some people work, uh, you know, uh, with with the whole environment, and then they don't selectively pull out these animals. Others do, um, and those systems where those those animals are maintained are actually um, not experiencing the kinds of conflicts where those interventions are happening. So, um, I think these are part these are part and parcel of the same. We got it. We got to, We've got to move many directions, and it's also not to say education. I didn't even talk about education tonight, but we need to also continue educating so that people understand these animals differently earlier on. Another couple of questions from the web. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll combine two. One is just wondering about. And this, you might not have an answer for this, but just wondering about the way in which coyote figures in indigenous uh, religious worldviews, if that might have contributed to uh, its uh, uh, marginalization as a pest. 
it, it's oh, connection it's a with. connection. You know, I, I don't know the history on that and whether or not, <laughs> whether or not colonists actually paid enough attention to right. indigenous um, uh, epistemology and, and whether they uh, understood that coyote was important. I mean, I'm sure there are certain groups that understood that coyote was a, was figured very prominently in in uh, First Nations understanding of the world, and 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 was an important player in you know very in some and again I, it's not I, I'm not entirely comfortable you know speaking on behalf of indigenous populations on 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 epistemology, but from my readings and that coyote can be. Uh, you know, omniscient can, is creator, is trickster. You know, plays all of these different roles and is essential in understanding engagements with nature, engagements with each other. And so, um, so yeah, I think. But but so, no, knowing that it's that important, I think it's a really it's a good question to say, did that get tied in there, uh, in terms of if we oppress this. And certainly in other cultures, I don't want to digress too far, but for example, uh, there's work done on Aboriginal culture in uh, Australia and the, and the colonialists specifically using killing dogs as a way to control and oppress um, populations because the dogs were so meaningful. Yes. I'm wondering also, uh, the first, I guess a big part of my question is like why coyotes, but within kind of the concept like coyotes being mammals, I can understand uh, especially a ability in seeking their personhood, the ability to personify more easily with mammals than anthropomorphize them in a sense. But I'm wondering like in a way, it, it's still like a hierarchical choice to choose mammals in that sense. Oh, and, yeah. Um, Whereas, like, when, what if we were to choose animals that were in such opposite relationship to us yep. that wouldn't that create a moment whereby all animals, therefore, or all plants, even, if we were to go to the world? I and I I understand. What, I think I understand what you're saying, and yeah. uh, I I don't mean this to be exclusive to coyotes or to be exclusive to mammals. I, I this is my entry point because yeah. this is sort of like oh, how are we going to work through this? We're going to work through this by saying, okay, where, how are we going to consider these animals? How do we, what's the steps we're going to go through to do that? But you're right. Like, if you look at something like an octopus and the things they're finding out about how incredibly intelligent they are, right? They are very far from us um, in terms of at least we think, we think they're very far from us, but they, they are incredibly uh, intelligent. And so, yeah, those other species, I don't mean to, that, that's not. This is my entry point into just trying to set a model forward to, to, to how do we do this with wildlife? And it's not in, you know, <laughs> where do you, you know, you have to look at, do we do that for every animal within the, 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 the in, in mammal, mammalian kingdom? I, you know, I, uh, yeah, it's a point, it's a starting point. Um, and, um, uh, and I think they all have to be considered on some, it, it's some way, right? And, and again, it, it comes back to this notion of um, if, if humans are the comparison, they, they you know, we, we, can't, we can't be using them as the comparison because they, we are just one expression of, 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 of how an animal engages in the world, right? So. Here's the second half of the. Oh, sorry. No, no, it's fine, no. Uh, no, but it's a future looking one. But again, sorry, it's asking you to speculate. Um, <laughs> but the question is, do you anticipate the current spirit of reconciliation in terms of recognizing indigenous culture and kinship and the increasing inclusion of traditional ecological knowledge will shift the jurisprudence around personhood, which I think is, I mean, in my experience is perhaps likely because I know a lot of the personhood cases involving glaciers and rivers have been mounted by indigenous groups in New Zealand or in India, or actually here in Canada as well. There, there was very definitely a connection between indigenous activism and, and personhood um, cases. Are you seeing that or hearing that? Or do you think there's a possibility for that? Or, sorry, this, I think is, there's this a is asking for speculation. I think there's, well, no, I, I mean, I think there's a possibility for it. And I think there's just, that's the, the greatest strength in it is going to is going to come from reframing in another epistemology and saying, you know, but 
I, I don't know of examples of, of that happening with animals, except that the most recent one was brought forward by Senator uh, Christmas, I think, uh, on, on uh, whales and dolphins in captivity. That bill was first put forward, uh, and that was based on the animal way of knowing, and it was based on indigenous understanding of those, those animals. That was the momentum that allowed that to, to move through it. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, I just have a question. So you're talking about um, sort of building the capacity to get ethics both from the perspective of the law, also the perspective of morals. And I mean, I can see like the importance of laws to protect animals, but also the importance of having like a fundamental worldview shift where people have the compassion to see like a, an animal that's unlike a human as being a person as well. And I'm wondering uh, to what extent is the law the most important facet? To what extent are other aspects most important? And, and I mean, how can we, from our different backgrounds, sort of pursue our strengths to build this compassion from the background of law, from the background of you know, animal lovers, and the background of someone who works on a ranch? So, like, there's, there's so many different ways to approach it. I, I think the op I think the educate you know, so in terms of the parallel paths of doing this, we've got the education. We do have, but the, but I do not believe things are going to shift noticeably unless we start to change the laws surrounding all animals here, um, in terms of the treatment of of, of animals, um, wildlife or whatever. So I think education is is a key part of it. The laws. The um, sorry, I'm losing my track of train of thought a little bit but um uh i think i think the other part that uh we have to think about is conversation <laughs> across across people come you know realizing that we are all often looking for the same thing but end up pitted against each other so so an example i can give you is you know working with with ranchers where you when when you realize that it, it's actually in both of your interests to have this this happen um to have the animals preserved on the landscape um and this isn't related to the personhood argument but but by doing that and realizing that one of the ways that we have to do that is say okay we stop fighting against each other you're telling me i have to not kill coyotes uh you know etc you you realize that the the solution to that is actually at a societal level where it's like how do you make how do you empower these people as as the livestock producers to be able to produce and not kill right so so these solutions have to come from thinking uh, at a bigger level but also having those conversations and 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 cutting through to what's what's common um, and then I think, you know, I, I, I have to I have to say, you know, I teach this animal geography class and uh, uh, each year and there's about 80 students in it. And I mean, I'm overwhelmed with the 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 the, the, <laughs> the ideology, the epistemology that runs this this new you know generation is is this. It is people. People are com are more compassionate towards animals, at least the ones I'm interacting with. And so I think there is a a shift. We, we're seeing this more and more on radar. Right? We've got fashion industries across the world stopping the use of of animal products. We've got certain animals are no longer allowed for consumption. You know, we've just got we've there is there's a momentum towards this. So I think it's continuing to have those conversations continuing to find where you fit into that and can make the, those changes. Well, I think on that note, I think we should show compassion to this human animal <laughs> who is maybe flagging a little bit, probably still on painkillers actually. <laughs> um, but I do want to invite you to stick around for more casual conversation, for a drink, for a snack, um, pick up a book on your way out. Um, but I'd like to thank you all once again yes. for coming. Uh, to thank uh, the people who made this happen. Thank Fort Calgary. Um, but most of all, uh, thank you, Dr. Shelley Alexander, for a wonderful stimulating lecture. Thanks, everyone. I, I also I just want to say I really enjoyed the, the questions, and uh, it's good to be.
but good to be pushed out of your comfort zone. So, so that's very good. Thanks.